So sorry for in the interruption, Claire. So last 40 years all papers of EPSC, it was a Herculean task for me to compile all those answers, tailor-made answers of the last 40 years. We have to write only one year paper in three hours and that itself becomes a challenging thing. So till to, from 1979 till 2019, I'm about to revise those two books. First book is on ancient and medieval India. Second is on world history and modern India, clear? There's a complete history of question answer also from history optional covering the whole syllabus as well. These are about books and these are about the experience that I have been sharing with all the candidates of history optional since a long time. The purpose of today's session is basically to discuss the history optional, the viability of history optional, the advantages of history optional, and how we are going to do this optional here at GSS School. Clear? First of all, I'll let you know, clear, apart from my introduction, this institute, there are many students who are from this institute also who are doing some course or other course, clear. This institute basically is known for conceptual clarity, in-depth analysis, and more importantly that I have realized is this is basically a practice-driven institute. Practice-driven means that's not only that everything will be just taught in the class, rather something will be taken out from you also so that individuality gets developed. So it focuses on regular writing practice that we'll be doing in history optional also, okay? Regular writing practice after covering each topic so that you need to know how to write answer, what needs to be the approach to write answers for effective mark fetching, clear? Okay? We'll be doing this practice driven approach, we'll be following history optional also, clear? Okay? Apart from all these things that are already going on, now we'll come to specific thing about history optional, clear? Okay? The today's class will have, I have decided into five agenda. Agenda is basically there are five things to be discussed for history optional elaborately in order to understand the nuances involved with this aspect of history optional, clear? That is five things or agendas, clear? The first major agenda which is very important that I have developed with a lot of contemplation is that first of all, the first question that arises for UPSC candidate is because it's not only history optional, we have got as many as more than 20 subjects available for optional subjects. Then, why history only, clear? So first major thing, first major agenda is why to choose history as optional subject or history optional, clear? Why to choose? The why, what is the purpose of all of us sitting here? Or what is the purpose of thinking that at least for once that history can be taken as an optional subject? At least once it must have come to your mind, that is why you are here, clear? Otherwise, you could have been sitting with other optional subjects. We cannot be denied out of... 22 or subjects, why history only, why to choose? We need to understand first of all this thing, clear? First of all, I'll let you know, clear? Normally, there's a perception among candidates, I'll let you know, that number of students getting selected from history optional seems to be less as compared to other subjects, clear? But this is not adequate thing to be understood. What is adequate thing is, you need to know how many students are writing mains examination with history optional and then you get to know how many candidates are getting finally selected by UPSC. Then you will come to know about the success ratio of history optional. For instance, I'll let you know, last report only that has been filed with RTI by UPSC to know about the performance of optional subject, clear? From geography, 2600 candidates wrote mains, clear? And out of those 2,600 candidates, 106 got finally recommended with different ranks, clear? There's no doubt. In history, almost 1,079 candidates wrote men's examination and 62 got recommended, clear? No, number seems to be less. That is 62 and more than 100, clear? Just understand one thing, clear? It may be public administration, maybe geography, but you need to know that out of 1,000 odd candidates, 60 candidates got selected, out of 2600 candidates, around about 100 candidates got selected. Success ratio makes it very clear, this subject is at par and even more scoring than that subject. The problem is number of candidates taking this subject and why do candidates don't take this subject will come to that also because I'm telling you, there are certain common myths about this subject, clear? And we will explore those myths also in this session. That is our second agenda, 
clear so first thing is as far as scoring pattern is concerned this subject is equally scoring as respect to other subjects clear more importantly i'll let you know clear that in the first paper of history option only this first question which is a compulsory question to be attempted by all candidates and that question is related to map entries clear 20 can sites or 20 locations should be given on a map and they will write a phase paleolithic phase mesolithic phase or buddhist site you just have to identify that site and you have to write 30 to 35 words short notes clear for that i have told you i have already compiled a work which is already there in the market nothing will come from outside that work because more than 500 sites are already there clear if you write attempt that question properly i'm telling you scoring is like mathematics clear out of 50 you can score 40 plus also clear and those who get good ranks in history they score 40 plus marks out of 50 in the very first question itself clear and if you score 40 marks out of 50 in the very first question and if you score 30 30 marks also in the remaining questions clear you can just easily count what would be a score a score would be 160 marks clear and you all know that is scoring 300 plus in any optional is a magic you are bound to be in the top rankers list. If you get 116 paper 1 and 115 paper 2 also, you have scoring 310 marks. Easily I'm telling you, clear? You can score 160 also in the second paper itself. You can score 320, 325 marks. And I'm telling you that deciding factor in UPSC selection still matters with respect to your score in optional. In GS, I'm telling you, normally all the candidates will score more or less the same except with respect to certain subjects like poly ethics and govern ethics ethics integrity there's a variation marks in essay there is certain variation marks but if you look to paper one paper two obviously marks are almost average to every candidate then what makes the difference between a topper and a candidate who has scored the last cat rank the difference is with respect to your score in optional subject so scoring 300 plus is not a challenge in history provided the right strategy and the right approach is adhered to at least for five months clear the work is done this is one thing scoring pattern another important thing is that predictability just understand clear this is very important in history the best part is predictability of questions is quite high now it needs to be explained clear a little know for instance take the first section of history that is ancient india the topics are basically sources then indus valley civilization then aryans then buddhism jainism mauryan empire gupta empire and all clear there are all together 12 topics syllabus has been given to all of you i'll explain everything there are all together 12 headings or topics of ancient india clear we will cover every topic and subtopic in class there's no doubt about it but again from examination perspective i'll let you know clear there are certain topics from where you are bound to get questions in mains examination clear and those topics for instance in this valley civilization you will get one question mains examination within that also i'll let you know there are two things that to needs to be covered elaborately one is characteristic of Indus Valley Civilization and second is factors for the decline of Indus Valley Civilization. From these two, you will get question. Why? Indus Valley is known for its characteristics. The most important being town planning because they planted their town very properly in a grid pattern or in a broad based pattern. Clear? You are bound to get questions. They were very highly progressive in nature. Urban civilization was there. Large number of cities were there. These are distinctive features. If you understand the subject properly and on your behalf, I have done that. Obviously, I'll let you know this topic needs to be done intensively because you will get questions. Clear? For instance, if you come to Vedic age, clear? Now, Vedic age basically said our coming of Aryans to India around 1500 BC. Then they compiled the first written work that is Rig Veda. Then later on from 1000 BC, later Vedic phase started because they compiled three other works that is Sam Ved, Yajur Ved and Athav Ved. Now, these are normal things that to be done. But from examination point of view, what is important is change and continuity. They'll ask you, what major political changes took place from the Rig Vedic phase to the later Vedic phase? Clear? Then another question, what major change for elements of continuity was there in the religious practices of early Vedic Aryans and the later Vedic Aryans? What major economic changes took place from the early Vedic phase to the later Vedic phase? Now, if we study this phase in the terms of change and continuity, 
obviously you are bound to get questions there from there and you can easily score very good marks because ancient India is very scientific in nature clear apart from this in ancient India more an empire clear do you think that any person who is preparing paper question paper will not ask any question from Ashok while preparing the question on ancient India because he was the greatest monarch of ancient India the most successful ruler in terms of religious ideology because he promoted Buddhism not only in India even outside Indian territory clear no we need to analyze Ashok elaborately no here we'll give proportional weightage also we'll cover Ashok elaborately different historiography related to Ashok. What do scholars say about Ashok? Clear? Some scholars like S. R. Chaudhary believe that Ashok for peaceful policy of Dham led to the destruction of Mauryan Empire. But scholars like Romila Thapar believe that Dham was a measure to consolidate Mauryan Empire. It did not decline because of his policy of peaceful annexation that is known as Dham Ghosh. So historiography also needs to be done elaborately because without Ashok obviously question paper cannot be justified for ancient India. This is one important thing. Predictability I'm talking about clear is very high in ancient India. After the decline of Mauryans, smaller dynasties came into being in India and at the same time invaders started to arrive in India from the northwestern side of India. See one thing I'll let you know, history needs to be understood in collective sense clear. Very important point I'm highlighting right now, India has always been vulnerable only from one side. I mean to say all invaders has attacked India only from one corner of Indian territory that is the northwestern corner of India. Why? Because we are blessed enough that India has natural frontiers on all its sides. On the northern side we are defended by Himalayas and its extension till the northeastern part of India. In its peninsular part of India we are li defended largely by water bodies, Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal region. One corner has always been vulnerable and still that corner is vulnerable because arch rival of India, Pakistan is sitting back there. Clear? This has always been the most important challenge of all Indian rulers. Clear? Even Ashok failed on this front. Clear? Because by the time Ashok was ruling, there was a contemporary Chinese ruler, Shi Huangdi. And at that time, tribals were invading China also. And Shi Huangdi constructed Great Wall of China, which is still a major wonder of the world. But Ashok did not construct such monument and northwestern part remained unguarded. That is why several invaders like Indo-Greeks, Shakas, Parthians and Kushans came to India. But the best part was when they came to India, they came with huge resources. Most importantly, gold they brought from Central Asia. And especially Kushan ruler Kanish, he was a very progressive ruler. Kanish began to circulate large number of gold coins and even patronize Mahayan sect of Buddhism. Clear? That is why when we study this phase, we focus on Kanishk at this time. He convened the fourth Buddhist council also. And during this council only, Buddhist followers got divided into Hinayan and Mahayan sects. So I mean to say that you need to understand Predictability of history optional questions are bound to be asked from certain sections. After Mauryan Empire, post Mauryan Empire, Guptas. If within Guptas also, they will not ask about any ruler except one. And that is Samudragupta. Why they will ask about Samudragupta? Because Samudragupta extended Mauryan kingdom considerably in all the directions. And we have concrete information about that expansion because his court poet Hari Sen wrote his biography on a rock surface which is known as Prayag Prashasti, also known as Allahabad Prashasti. So only Samudgrup from political perspective. You don't have to study about Chandragrup first, you don't have to study about Chandragrup second. But then what to be studied in Gupta period? You have to study about economy. Why? Trade started to decline and land grants began to be given to Brahmins because they patronized Brahminical faith. And that marked the beginning of a very important development in late ancient India known as beginning of feudalism. And from feudalism you are bound to get questions because it's a conceptual thing because feudalism alone was a single factor or central factor that transformed the society of ancient India to the early medieval India. That central factor was land grants, first started by the Satwans and largely followed by the Gupta rulers and even continued by Harshwardhan also, who came later on. Okay? From Harshwardhan, you will not get any question because from Harshwardhan was not a political ruler. But Harshwardhan was not himself great. He was greatness was because of two persons okay? who highlighted Harshwardhan to be a great ruler. That persons were Panabhat, his court poet who wrote Harsh Charit. And second was Chinese Buddhist traveler Yuan Sang. 
who came to in the reign of Harshwadhan wrote a glorifying account about it. Harshwadhan himself was not great because he was defeated by Pulakesh in second on the banks of river Narmada. But he was, his greatness was because of two persons who glorified him to a large extent. Clear? Therefore, you are good question. You get a question also. Harshwadhan was not the last ruler of ancient India, nor a great ruler. Obviously, he was not the last ruler because other rulers followed and not a great ruler himself. But his greatness was because of two major personalities who existed during his reign. This was Harshwadhan. No. This is whole ancient India. You have to attempt only two questions. Can't you attempt two questions? Why I'm telling you? Because in history optional, if you look into paper wise distribution, paper one includes ancient and medieval India, ancient India in section A, medieval India in section B. Question number five and question number one are compulsory. One is map entries in ancient India, and five you will get from medieval India short notes. Only three questions remains, and instructions say by UPSC, you have to attempt on this one question from each section. So if you are writing one question from ancient India, you will have to write two questions from medieval. If you are writing two questions from ancient India, you will have to write only one question from medieval India. But tell me, out of the topics that I told you, can't you write one or two questions from ancient India? Predictability is quite high. And this predictability will further increase when we move to on to second section, that is medieval India. So don't get bogged by the slavers. Clear? We'll come to that myth also. Clear? But at the same time, it is, it is very clear that predictability is very high. Coming to medieval India, I'll let you know. Clear? There also predictability is much better than ancient India. The reason being, again, I'll let you know. Medieval India is divided into two phases, that is early medieval phase and the later medieval phase. In early medieval phase, they will not ask questions about political history because politically there's only one thing that took place. That thing was there was a conflict between Palas, Pratiharas and Rajkutas to gain mastery over Kannauj. But that is not much important. Politically they can ask only about one thing that is extreme southern part of India because Cholas began to rule in the southern part of India and they extended the control not only over India but even over present Sri Lanka and even into the Bay of Bengal region as well. Chola rulers are very important culturally also because they constructed large temples in southern part of India, clear? But why this phase is important? This phase is important because debates related to Indian feudalism, clear? Because this was the phase of feudal trends. Land grants were given at this time. This land grants has been studied elaborately by R. S. Sharma. He has written a book also on Indian feudalism. We'll discuss about the theory given by R. S. Sharma related to Indian feudalism. This is one thing. At the same time, early medieval phase is important for philosophers. Some great philosophers emerged at this time. We get short notes because first question is compulsory in medieval India. Five short notes are to be written. The most important philosopher being Shankarachar. They will get question on Shankarachar or you will get question on Ramanuj. Clear? Cholas constructed large number of temples. The most prominent being Brihadeshwara temple, which is a shift temple located at Tanjore, the capital city of the Cholas. Clear, very important. Even Bharatanatyam started from the premises of this temple. This temple even began to perform business activities also in course of time. Clear? So Cholas. So early medieval phase, if you look at that, two topics are there. That is cultural traditions and political history. Politically, you have to read only about Cholas and culturally, Shankrachar, Ramanuj, or temple architecture started by the Cholas. Is that clear? A medieval phase starts with arrival of Turkish warriors to India, who first of all established the Delhi Sultanate, because Delhi was the capital, and Sultanate is a term for empire in Persian. So it's known as empire with its center at Delhi, known as Delhi Sultanate. And Delhi Sultanate is much more easier, I'm telling you, clear? The reason being, within Delhi Sultanate, you have to be specific about rulers, clear? Starting with slave dynasty, the rulers were Iltat, Mish, and Balban. Clear? From Balban, you will not get any question related to only one thing. Balban gave his own theory of kingship known as divine origin of kingship, whereby he proclaimed he is the shadow of God on earth and his position must not be challenged by anyone. Clear? There's one thing. Iltatmi started the Ikta system. Iltatmi is considered to be founder. But more and most important ruler in Delhi Sultanate was Alauddin Khalji. Now, when we come to Alauddin Khalji, obviously we have to study elaborately about Alauddin Khalji, his political expansion also, his cultural contribution also, and more importantly, his market control regulations, because he wanted to establish a large standing army without creating any burden on Sultanate treasury. And why large standing army was needed? Because during his reign, six Mongol invaders came to India. He wanted to defend Delhi Sultanate against Mongol invaders. So Alauddin Khalji being a very pragmatic person, he went for very 
radical reforms at this time, agrarian reforms also, economic reforms. And again, why do we study about Alauddin Khaji elaborately? Because he ruled only for 20 years, from 1296 to 1316, because we have complete historiography available about Alauddin Khaji. The most important being Amir Khusro. Amir Khusro was his court poet, his constitutive with a composed, representative of India's composite culture, and Amir Khusro wrote elaborately about Alauddin Khalji's conquest and achievements. Apart after Alauddin Khalji, the next monarch of Delhi Sultan is Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Clear? And Muhammad bin Tughlaq is remembered is only for one thing. Clear? He undertook five experiments and projects during his tenure, but unfortunately, all those experiments failed. That is why a question is asked, Muhammad bin Tughlaq was a transcendental failure, clear? That is why sometimes we use a word for him, Sanki, clear? Because he was a kind of Sanki person. Whatever idea came to his mind, he wanted to implement that. Five experiments were taken, clear? The experiments were token currency. In place of silver coins, he began to circulate bronze coins. He transferred the capital from Delhi to Dalatabad, Karachi expedition, and so on, clear? That is why when he died, Contemporary writer Bernie commented, Sultan got relieved of his people. People got relieved of Sultan because both got frustrated from each other. Sultan got frustrated because none of his experiments succeeded and people got frustrated because of its projects and experiments. Muhammad bin Tughlaq was followed by Firoz Shah Tughlaq and Firoz Shah Tughlaq is remembered in history for contribution towards civil engineering and other works. He led the basis of several towns in India, that is Firozabad. Two Firozabad named after him. One Firozabad right now located in the region of Uttar Pradesh. And another Firozabad, which is right now known as Hisar in Haryana. It was originally known as Hisar Firoza. Clear? Firoza Shah Tughlaq also led the basis of Hoskhas in Delhi near IIT. Firoz Shah Tughlaq was man of a civil engineering and took several works. Swimming pools were constructed, orchards were constructed. All these orchards are located in the region of Haryana. Right now, these orchards are basically marriage destination. But all these were led by Firoz Shah Tughlaq. So depending on a specific work done by them, you have to study these monarchs. Once you do this, predictability is quite high. So Balwan, Alauddin Khalji, Mohabban bin Tughlaq, only five experiments, Feroz Shah Tughlaq. Delhi Sultanate done. Clear? You are bound to get questions. Are you getting my point? After the end of Delhi Sultanate, provincial kingdoms came into being, and among those provincial kingdoms, you get questions on one kingdom regularly, and that was the Vijayanagar kingdom, because it became the cultural capital of South India, especially during the reign of Krishna Dev Raya, KDR. He ruled in the beginning of 16th century, contributed significantly towards political expansion and growth and construction of temples as well. So if you read Vijayanagar, we have to study about Krishna Dev Raya or KGR. Very much predictable at all together. You don't have to read smaller rulers. You don't have to mug up dates. We'll come to those myths also. i burst all those myths related to this optional subject. Clear? After this, Mughals came to India. Babur came to India. You don't have to read anything about Babur. Four battles he fought. He emerged victorious. No. Babur was a cultural personality. That is very important because he wrote his own autobiography in his mother tongue, which was not Persian. Chaktai Turki, clear? Babar Nama, very important work written by him. He was a musician also, clear? And at the same time, a dancer also, clear? So Babar was a cultured person of medieval India, which is normally asked in examination, not his political conquest and aggression. When Babar died, he was replaced by his son, Humayu. But Humayu was not a great military ruler, because Humayu could rule only for 10 years, from 1530 to 1540. Thereafter, Humayu was defeated and forced to leave Indian territory by an Afghan ruler, Seisha Suri. Clear? Humayu went to Persia, and while he was moving to Persia along with his wife, a son was born to him at Amar Court in Sindh in 1542. That is Akbar, who proved to be the greatest monarch of medieval India. Seisha established Sur Empire in India, even though Seisha ruled only for five years, 1540 to 1545. Seisha, you will get question because he contributed to first if you words efficient administration art and architecture, patronage to language and literature. Why? First of all, administration because he fixed local responsibility for local crime. Whenever local crime took place, he did not catch the culprit. He declared the local officers to be responsible and punished them strictly. That is why no local crime took place during the reign of Sher Shah. Clear? Sher Shah is remembered because he constructed a large number of road networks, the most important being from Sonar in Bengal to Peshawar in the Northwest, which is right now known as 
the GT road. That is the Grand Trunk road. Seisha also constructed a large number of sarais for the persons to stop at every 8 kilometers for their safety. Seisha also gave patronage to literary personalities, the most important being Malik Muhammad Jaisi, who wrote a very important work, Padmavad, and that too in Hindi language. It's considered to be a masterpiece in Hindi language. That means not only patronized the Persian language, but he gave patronage to Hindi language and literature in medieval times as well. After Sesha, weak rulers came into being and Sur Empire came to an end. Meanwhile, Humayun returned back to Persia with Persian military support, regained back his power in India in 1555. But in the very next year, Humayun died in 1556 after falling from the stairs of his personal library. Sher Mandal at Delhi, and Humayu was succeeded by his 14 years old son, that is Akbar. And Akbar ruled almost for half century, 1556 to 1605. Initially, Akbar was not ready to rule, and therefore all the powers were undertaken and undertaken by his tutor, Bairam Khan. But Bairam Khan maintained his control only for four years, and thereafter Akbar started systematic policy of expansion. Now, in medieval India. Any examiner who will prepare the question paper cannot prepare without asking questions on Akbar. As it was the case with respect to ancient India, without Ashok, question paper cannot be made. Without Akbar in medieval India, Akbar cannot, question paper cannot be complete. And what needs to be asked about Akbar? Clear? We need to understand. First of all, Akbar's Rajput policy. Clear? Akbar was very liberal in his approach. In order to conquer different parts of India, he needed the support of the greatest warrior class of India, Rajputs ruling over northern and western part of India. In fact, he cemented his ties with Rajputs with matrimonial alliances. He got married to different Rajput families. They gave their daughters and that is the, at the same time, they gave the commitment to serve Akbar till the last breath. That proved to be biggest point. Clear? At the same time, Akbar is unique in history because of his religious ideas. Akbar wanted to maintain harmony. Initially, he personally he was the follower of Islamic faith. And in order to know about Islam, he established Ibadat Khana in 1575. But after some time, he opened the gates of Ibadat Khana to the heads of other religious faiths as well. Akbar gave the principle of Sulhe Kul as he wanted to maintain peace among all religions. Clear? Akbar was very unique for his religious ideas. Clear? Rajput policy religious policy and administratively why Akbar is important because during the reign of Akbar two important institutions came into being known as the Jagirdari system and the Mansabdari system that became the backbone of Mughal Empire. Three things had to be done with respect to Akbar. Clear? Once these three things are done you will get questions. Normally comparative questions are asked. Akbar established Mughal Empire with enlisting the support of Rajputs. Aurangzeb destroyed Mughal Empire by De 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 deviating from Rajput policy. You get comparative questions also, clear? So you, if you know about Rajput policy, easily it, it can be done. After Akbar, several rulers came into being, that is Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb. Now predictability point of view, just understand. From Jahangir, one question you are bound to get, look into the previous paper. Jahangir was not interested in political expansion. Jahangir was a man of artistic ideas. And Mughal painting reads its zenith under Jahangir. So the, you will get questions on development of Mughal paintings under Jahangir. Clear? And after Jahangir, when Shah Jahan came to power, Mughal architecture reads its zenith under Shah Jahan. Because Shah Jahan constructed large number of monuments. First of all, he led the base of Shah Jahan Abad in Delhi, where he constructed Jama Masjid. At the same time, he constructed the Red Fort also. Shah Jahan constructed the most important monument, that is the Taj Mahal at Agra, which was basically the mausoleum of his wife. Clear. Shah Jahan also constructed Moti Masjid, and that is why he is considered to be the great constructor of, builder of medieval India. Most of the monuments in red sandstone, clear? Only one monument in white marble and that was Moti Masjid, Mosque of Pearl, clear? There are two Moti Masjid in India. One Moti Masjid in the Agra Fort constructed by Shah Jahan. Another Moti Masjid at the Red Fort in Delhi constructed by Aurangzeb, clear? All these developments took place under Shah Jahan. So with respect to Jahangir, you have to know about Mughal paintings. With respect to Shah Jahan, Mughal architecture. And when we come to Aurangzeb after Shah Jahan, the most important work, Aurangzeb proved to be quite religious fundamentalist at this time and therefore large number of diverse sections began to deviate and Aurangzeb's reign was marked by large number of revolts and rebellion. 
throughout the empire. Clear? Among those revolts and rebellion, one person who gave challenge to Aurangzeb for a longer period of time, that person was none other than the Maratha leader Shivaji. He established Maratha kingdom in the western part of India, challenged Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb gave due attention to Shivaji and therefore left the affairs in the northern part of India at Agra. That is why they said the biggest factor for the decline of Mughal Empire was Aurangzeb's preoccupation with Shivaji in the region of Dakkan. Clear? This was one thing. You get a question also in mains examination. A Spanish ulcer ruined Napoleon. Clear? Deccan ulcer ruined Aurangzeb. Because or Napoleon in world history focused too much on Spain. And similarly, it was done by Aurangzeb also here. And therefore, it led to decline and disintegration of Mughal Empire. Clear? Jagirdari crisis, other crises responsible for decline will come to know. This was about Aurangzeb. At the same time, after decline, death of Aurangzeb, Mughal Empire began to decline and disintegrate. Smaller kingdoms came into being like Bengal. Then at the same time, Marathas, Mysore under Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan and other leaders. That starts the beginning of modern phase when Europeans started to come to India, that is the Dutch, the British and the French at this time, clear, modern India. So this was about ancient and medieval India. Now tell me one thing, clear, is predictability quite easily understood about history optional? Can it be handled easily? If you prepare these topics well, you are bound to write questions and of, out of eight questions you have to write only five. Out of five, one and five are compulsory. You have to choose only three questions. Can't you write three questions? One question from ancient India, two from medieval. If you are comfortable with ancient India, write two from ancient India, one from medieval India. The work is done. Clear? Map entries already has been done. We'll come to that also. And at the same time, short notes. Amir Khusro will be asked. Khalsa Pant of Sikh religion will be asked. At the same time, they will ask about Abul Fazl also, who wrote Akbar Nama, which is a very important source about the reign of Akbar. This was about paper one. Similar predictability, the purpose was to give an idea. Similar predictability exists for second paper also that covers modern India and world history, clear? In modern India, obviously we can understand British expansion. They will bound to go ask questions from Bengal because British for British, Bengal was the most important province because of its economic resources, clear? So Battle of Plassey followed by Battle of Baksar, clear? After the establishment, British East India Company began to rule over India. Predictability I'll let you know, clear? You are bound to get at least not one, but two questions from one single topic of modern India. That is economic impact of British rule. Because major impact of British was felt on economic sphere. Because British East India Company was a private company who was there in India only to earn profit. So they exploited Indian resources like anything. And economic impact you have to study about land revenue settlements, permanent, Rayotwari, Mahalwari settlements. You have to study about drain of wealth from India to Britain, deindustrialization, commercialization of agriculture, landless agrarian class that emerged at this time. All these are important things. So from economic history, you are bound to get two questions. Modern India is much more predictable, I'm telling you. Not only this, modern India is very predi much predictable in GS also, I'll let you know, clear? In modern India, tell me one thing, clear? All these topics have to be done in GS also. We'll come to that point, clear? From modern India, any examiner who will prepare the question, they will ask question from conquest of Bengal. That is bound to be there. In modern India, the examiner will always ask questions on economic impact of British rule. In modern India, examiner will automatically ask questions from social religious reform movement. One question anywhere. It will be whether it is in GS or in optional. Clear? Whether it is Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Swami Dhanan Saraswati, Swami Vivekanan, Sar Sayyad Ali Khan, you will get question from social religious reform movement. One question from Acts. Starting with the Regulating Act of 1773 and culminating with the Government of India Act. 1935, predictability is quite high. All acts. This predictability is there in modern India for prelims also, for mains also. No examiner will prepare the paper without touching these topics. It has to be done because that will become meaningless. Clear? After this, when we start with national movement, formation of Indian National Congress, Gandhian era. From Gandhian era, forget the time that the question used to be asked from non-cooperation or civil disobedience. These days, there are questions on working class agitation participation of women in national movement, participation of students in national movement, growth and development of press in modern India. We'll be covering all these areas. Leave aside, anyway, we'll be covering Swadeshi movement, non-cooperation movement, and civil disobedience movement. But we will focus more on 
these developments that were taking working class peasant movement very important development that took place in the, in the course of national movement clear after this we have to move to post independent era in post independent era the most important thing was that when india became independent it was divided into two sections one was british india that was relieved after india's independence and apart from british india there were more than 550 princely states in india who were never convert, con, con, conquered by the british they were ruling as independent rulers and most of them wanted to rule independently even after 1947 but india was blessed to have a very prominent person as first home minister of independent india sardar vallabh bhai patel and through persuasion and pressure sardar vallabh bhai patel integrated almost all the princely states including kashmir also including junagadh in western part of india hyderabad also manipur also and other states as well so integration of princely states very important topic second important thing when princely states got integrated next major challenge was that some people in india demanded reorganization of states india being a large country and the criteria for reorganization said was language linguistic criteria for reorganization said which was first raised by the telugu speaking people in southern part of india and that ultimately forced government of india to create the first linguistic state in the form of andhra pradesh in 1952 followed by the bifurcation of bombay into two linguistic provinces of maharashtra and gujarat in 1960 that continues even now of late in the year 2000 three hindi speaking states were divided into create further three hindi speaking states at this time and these were chatisgarh jharkhand and uttarakhand parties bifurcated from madhya pradesh bihar and uttar pradesh clear so all these developments post independent era we'll discuss our question of national language also because we don't have any national language the debate was basically around official language clear because right now we follow the concept of english as official language of india but at the same time promoting hindi and other regional languages as well question of national language we'll discuss about caste and ethnicity especially the ambedkar movement after india's independence clear we'll discuss about the commission that was constituted in the janta government in 1978 that resulted into reservation for obcs that is the mandal commission we'll discuss all these developed ecology environment the more important being the chipko movement recently narmada bachao andolan all these are topics of post independent era predictability is high don't worry and it's very interesting also you will find all these things and whatever i'm discussing i'll let you know all these are there with general studies also don't worry even you do, we don't opt for optional history optional you have to read all the history subject though total because in gs also yeah, everything is mentioned clear this is one thing to be understood so predictability same thing applies for modern history also french revolution american war of independence you are bound to get questions from five revolutions american revolution french revolution industrial revolution russian revolution chinese revolution you will get questions german unification italian unification you will get questions then ussr decline of soviet union communism rise of us as lone superpower in the world these are things to be done so my question is this point is that predictability in this subject is quite high and with this predictability attempting five questions out of eight will not be a major challenge you have to leave three questions there also are you getting my point there's one thing why to choose history optional so second thing is scoring after scoring is predictability you no know, interesting as we are discuss right now clear for writing anything any subject you have to take precedence from history only it's quite quite interesting in nature depending on how the teacher takes the subject clear why interesting i am telling you clear it's not only about mugging up will burst the myth also related to history optional it's about understanding the subject clear i'll tell you from certain entry points in history for instance i'll let you know right now we had discussed one central factor that transformed ancient india to medieval india was not the arrival of turks it was land grants that transformed the culture this is one thing entry points i'll let you know clear there are many entry points clear buddhism and jainism there are entry points because that marked the reaction against orthodox vedic religion so they went for unorthodox or heterodox religions that is buddhism and jainism this is an entry point in in the subject in medieval india entry points is basically akbar because akbar why entry point from akbar everything got changed clear that was being pursued by earlier rulers earlier rulers were highly 
religious in nature, but Akbar was quite tolerant in nature. And after Akbar also, that tolerant could not be followed. And therefore, again radicalism began to merge. So entry points are there. With these entry points, it becomes very interesting. One thing I told you, all the invaders who had come to India, they had come only from one side. So one clarity is there from ancient India, starting with Aryans and coming up to the late up to Ahmad Shah Abdali, modern India. All of them came only from one side, the northwestern region of India. Quite interesting, you need to understand. At the same time, why they came to India only? Why not other parts? They wanted to go other parts, but they could not go to China because of Great Wall of China. They came to India because of huge resources, clear? Because India had plain resources. In Central Asia, that resources were not there. Of late in modern times, we have found one major resource in Central Asia, that is oil and gas, natural gas. Otherwise, at that time, technology was not developed. So they were wandering for resources, and in that process, they came to Indian territory also. Clear? This was one thing. These are major interesting things. So you don't have to force yourself to learn. It is a natural process that will automatically learn and it's very interesting in nature. I'm telling you. In fact, international relations you learn. Clear? International, who is concerned with the pioneer of international relations? That is foreign diplomacy. The person is Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck. A person who unified Germany. Because Bismarck was one person who started to make Germany the most powerful country by even playing with his opponents also. Clear? That was the big, biggest thing and biggest victory of Bismarck. Clear? And therefore Bismarck is considered to be the beginner of alliances and counter alliances. And just because of that only the whole Europe got polarized into two branches, triple alliance and triple entente. And just because of this only the first world war started between these two power blocks in 1914. But that was led basis by Otto von Bismarck. Quite interesting in nature. So when you will read, you will get engrossed in the subject, clear? And that, to be engrossed, everything lies in the faculty, I'm telling you, clear? When we were also students, clear, we used to like some subjects because of teacher only. We used to don't like certain subjects because of teacher only. That happens, it happens everywhere, even at this state of life also, clear? But anyone who has got mastery over the subject will never let you down. That is one thing which is very sure. These are about interesting, because until this it is interesting, you cannot study for five months regularly because you have to study at least two and a half hours in the class and at least one hour to revise in the back at your home. Clear? How will you study without interest? Until that interest is generated within you, at least by me. It's not about reading pages after pages. It's about making it interesting in nature. Clear? This is another thing. Why to choose history optional? A study material also. See, normally we choose any subject because depending on availability of subject matter also, like animal husbandry. How, may, how many people will go for animal husbandry until they have the background? Because material is also not largely available. But these subjects, history and all, you have got large amount of study material also. And in this session, you don't have to go with any study material. Even though study material will be given to you, I'm, be, I'm being very candid. I will make you write everything in the class itself. I first I'll explain the concept and I'll make you write. So that after going back at your place, you don't have to wonder about books and material. Just read my class notes and check me also. Don't be murids. When we'll take Sufism in medieval India, there was a concept of peer and murid. Clear? Murids were blind followers of the peer. Clear? But you don't need to be that. You need to check me also. And how to check any person with respect to UPSC? Only one thing has been given by UPSC directly to you. And that is syllabus. Look into the syllabus. Whether I'm covering all the topics or subtopics or not. Whether I'm missing. When all the topics and subtopics will, will be there in your register, what is the need to go for material and all? What to run on the, on the market? People run in the market. We used to run, we used to run the market when we were a student for map entries. I'll give you map entry book only. People used to run for in the market for previous question and answer. I'll give you that book only. All the remaining topics and topics will be there in your restaurant only. You don't have to run anywhere. My work is to simplify your process rather than to make it complicated. This one thing is very clear. The apart from this, no study with why to choose history optional. Last but not the least, very important to be understood is you are appearing for this examination. You need to score everywhere. It's every by means you need to score in your four GS paper also, essay also, and finally in optional also. Even though optional plays a major role, but GS also cannot be ignored. Clear? The best one of the best part with this subject is it has got high synonymity with GS. 
if we look into paper one of general studies first six topics is on history only first topic is on art and culture art forms language and literature architecture that obviously will be covering elaborately in history second topic is on national modern india starting from middle 18th century it is conquest of bengal that we discuss right now battle of plassey and it covers the whole of national movement even post independent era that we discuss consolidation of india prince accession of princely states question of national language linguistic reorganization states gs slavers is there world history is also there in general studies clear and you will be covering world history in optional also first six topics of paper one of general studies you don't have to run anywhere are you getting my point remaining six topics three topics are on social issues and three topics or four topics on geography paper one done clear so at least out of 250 marks roughly 150 marks is from history and more importantly you will be writing first question from history only in gs also and that will boost your morale and confidence also there are you getting my point clear because first question will be on culture that is for sure obviously you will be writing from history and that will be your first paper also to boost the morale and confidence also history cannot be ignored it has to be done so synonymity with gs is a major factor because right now gs has become a challenge because four papers are to be done but at least if one paper or 60 percent of one paper can be done with option only at least your workload can be reduced drastically remaining time you can focus on social issues and geography paper one is done 250 marks is done so not only preparing for 500 marks you are preparing for gs marks also there's another thing and more importantly another important thing is this subject many of you i know must be prepared to write your PSC examination alone. But there are many candidates who even decide to write side by side, not exclusively, side by side, state services also. And in state services, history again is a very popular subject, clear? And with history, people are scoring and getting ranks in different states also, clear? Same syllabus, because unified concept is being followed right now. Same syllabus, everything. Once you are prepared, you are prepared not only for UPSC, you are prepared for your state examination this is another important factor also so these are the factors whereby we say that history can easily be taken as an optional subject so why to choose history as an optional subject is that clear to everyone clear coming to another agenda of this take is busting of common myths now very important clear many questions must be coming to mind even now okay but first of all we'll understand what do we mean by this bursting of common myths first thing normally in everywhere your friends in the pg also or other places also in your hostel also rooms also say first thing that is there about history is it's with lengthy in nature first point that is given for history optional it's very lengthy in nature clear now we'll have a discussion on this clear see i'll let you know first important thing is History has been elaborately given in your slippers. Nothing is hidden. There are some subjects whose slippers has got inherent topics. Philosophy seems to be very small. But inherent things are, hidden things are too much in philosophy. Are you getting my point? It's not that. Because UPSC obviously will not discriminate. It will keep all the optional subjects at par. With history, if you look into optional subjects, I'll let you know. With ex until we see examples, we won't be able to believe. First of all, I'll let you know. Look into the very first topic of ancient India. Slavers has been given to you. You will understand much better. First topic is sources. Clear? Within sources, the topics are exploration, excavation, epigraphy, numismatics, monuments, literary sources, indigenous, then scientific literature, literature in regional languages, religious literature, foreign accounts, Greek, Chinese, and Arabic. Does this clear to all of you? Clear? Now do understand one thing. We will have to cover this topic because we'll get question sources, but at the same time, don't you think that when we we cover in this valley civilization, we'll have to study about excavation? How do we come to know about Indus Valley civilization? With excavation only, because we have excavated the cities in the region of Haryana, in the region of Punjab, Rajasthan, in the northwestern part of India. So excavation obviously will be studied when we'll study Indus Valley civilization. This is repetition. Another, epigraphy is mentioned separately. 
when we study about Ashok, obviously we'll read about Ashoka and Eddie's inscriptions. When we study about Samudgup, we'll study about Priyak Prashasti or Labhad Prashasti because epigraphy means study of inscription. So anyway, apart from studying here, we'll be studying that tea in later course of time as well throughout ancient India. Don't you think it's a repetition? Don't you think? This topic, this topic could have been avoided also. They could have started from prehistory and proto-history. There was no need. Greek writers, when we study about Chandragupta more, we'll talk about Megasthenes who came to India. When we talk Greek writers, we'll come to other writers also. At the same time, Chinese, Faiyan, Yuan Sang. When we study about Guptas, we'll talk about Faiyan. When we talk about Harshwardhan, we'll talk about Yuan Sang. Clear. Right now only we discuss that Harshwardhan himself was not great, but his greatness was because of two personalities, Yuan Sang and Banbhat. Don't you think it's a repetition? The slavery seems to be large, but overlapping is there. Clear? Coming forward, clear. All these things you look into that, clear? Next, just look into the topic number 11. Look into topic number 11. 30 to 40 percent slavery is totally, I rather it has been exaggerated. You have to cover it one place. Look into topic number 11. The Kadambas, the Pallavas, the Chalukyas, the Badami, Polity Administration. Topic number 11, regional states during Gupta era, clear? Look into it. literature, growth of Vaishna and Shaiva religions, Tamil Bhakti movement, Shankarachar, Vedant, temple architecture, Palas, Senas, Rashtakutas and so on. These topics are there. Seems to be our last topic, clear? Now look into the topic that is 13th topic, early medieval India. You will find Cholas there also. No, we have to study cholas at least one as a single topic. You will find cholas there also. You will find cholas here also. Temple institution architecture will study here also. It is mentioned the later topic also. Shankarachar, look in Shankarachar and Vedar. And go into topic number 14. You will find philosophy. First topic is Shankarachar. Repetition. I'm telling you. There are repetitions. And there are repetitions many places, I'm telling you. Don't worry about that. Look into modern India. Modern India, first topic. European penetration into India. The European settlements, the Portuguese and the Dutch, the English and the French East India Company. Then, con Bengal. The conflict between English and Nawabs of Bengal, Siraj and the English, Battle of Plassey, significance of Plassey. Is that right? Now, when we'll study about Bengal, we'll study not only about Siraj Udala. We'll study about other rulers like Mir Qasim and Mir Jafar also because Mir Jafar only betrayed Mir Siraj Udala in the battle of Plassey. That is why Bengal army got defeated. Now coming to second topic, look into British expansion in India. Bengal again, Mir Jafar, Mir Qasim, battle of Baksar. Don't you think it's an elaboration? Because anyway Bengal, it will have to be covered with Bengal only. And these are not last topics. It can be covered in single go only. So topics has been, it's stretched. Don't worry about the length of the topic. 30 to 40 percent can be easily curtailed if you go by topic by topic. Clear? And in course of time I'll do that also. I'll come up with a video just to make it clear that history, whatever is the syllabus given by UPSC, at least it can be reduced to 30 to 40 percent without eliminating any topic. We will not do that. Clear? So don't worry about the length. Normally I know people say, but this is not justified if you look into syllabus properly and minutely. This is one thing. This is one myth to be understood. Another myth is history means memorization. You have to memorize dates. You have to memorize figures. You have to memorize about the names of the rulers, battles. No, just understand one thing. Clear? They are not testing your range of information. They are testing your conceptual clarity and understanding. In fact, they will never ask a question that will ensure mentioning of facts and figures. Clear? Normally in modern India, the question that is asked is, clear? the Regulating Act of 1773 failed to achieve its objectives. Discuss. No, you don't have to write that when it was passed, who was the governor general? No. Why it failed? You need to understand that. Conceptual clarity. You don't have to mug up. And believe me, I'm telling you, don't write dates and figures too much. It proves to be counterproductive. Rather write conceptual and contextual understanding. That is much more important. Clear? In ancient India, suppose some people write, Aryans arrived in India in 1500 BC. I would say don't write this. You write, Aryans arrived in India by the middle of second millennium BC. Don't write dates. 
are you getting my point clear avoid that it's very important because that will indicate your analysis also clear for instance i'll let you when mahatma gandhi came to india clear and in the year 1919 he decided to launch his first mass movement in the form of non cooperation movement clear bipan chandra writes if you go through bipan chandra that is book india struggle for independence bipan chandra writes in the very first paragraph clear mahatma gandhi decided to launch his first mass movement in the last year of the second decade of 20th century he could have written 1919 also are you getting my point why to take any risk if you write battle of plassey you have forgotten your date in fact i would say forget the date right battle of plassey that took place in the middle of the 18th century even if you don't remember that right battle of plassey that took place in the 18th century it is not wrong rather it says you know the major things and you are not focusing on facts and figures you are more focusing on depth understanding so don't have to memorize don't have to mug up anything clear understand the nuances of the subject very well this is another myth because in school days we have this myth that normally you have to memorize you don't have to memorize one thing and whatever things has to memorize and believe me you will get it done in the class itself whatever facts and figures are required otherwise not more than that because i'll be telling first i'll explain then i'll make you write twice or thrice it will be done here only nothing to be done okay another thing is a scoring pattern as we had discussed clear that if you look into scoring pattern it is not less than any other popular subject but since number of appearing candidates is less than popular optionals obviously it seems that less number of candidates are getting selected but success ratio is more than geography and pub ed also if you look into number of candidates appearing in mains examination and finally being recommended by upsc so scoring pattern another is comparison with other subjects so we have discussed all the benefits why to choose history optional if we compare with other subjects first of all comparison i'll let you know very very candidly history optional once it is done it is done make my words take my word. once history optional once done it's done what do you mean by say in comparison to other subjects once it is done it's not done even geography is not done public administration not done sociology not done why i am saying this the reason is paper 2 of all these optional subjects needs to be updated with current developments every year if he or if unfortunately any candidate fails to qualify with sociology in his first attempt and when he will go for another mains in the next year he will have to update the whole paper too with all current developments and case studies but history once done once done if you have four registers with you in the class done it's done state examination also upsc also because how much will you update how much what will what will you update with with respect to sesha what will you update with respect to agba it's done it's already taken place clear okay so you don't have certain updation may be required in world history with respect to institutions like nato because obviously the questions are being raised on validity of nato especially with respect to ukrainian crisis going on clear this can be done but it's very meager i'll do that in class itself clear otherwise what will you update update with respect to ashok what will you update with respect to sirajud dola perspectives may change but updation is not required that's a reality so once done done once you have revised done writing practice with same thing you have to write your mains examination don't run after do you don't have to run after updation and taking all current materials and all but without yojana without krukshet can you prepare public administration sociology every month reality this is the major thing another thing is time management with respect to this only associated time and once it is done in 4 or 5 4 and a half months you have to manage your own time to prepare thing to revise and to do writing practice and all you don't have to go for updation and all so time management is quite easy with respect to this subject and predictability as we discuss is quite high since with this predictability select the topics prepare it properly then write the examination do writing practice do the test series you'd have to don't have to churn the new wheel you have to go on repeating the same exercise and you till the time you will keep on revising the exercise things will get consolidated in your mind properly and when you take your mains examination that will indicate your 
peak performance. We'll talk about that peak performance also. How to achieve that peak performance in the mains examination there. Because until this you attain the peak performance, how will you excel with other candidates? Make it very clear. When you take history as your optional subject, your competition is only with history optional candidates. Your competition is not with philosophy. Your competition is not with geography. You have to be best among all those candidates who are writing mains with history optional. Because every topper or every top performer gets 70% marks. If you are top among them, you are done. Because anyway, mathematics and history cannot be compared. Sanskrit literature and mathematics cannot be compared. They go for normalization also, UPSC examination, clear? So history, you don't, have, don't think that if he has opted for geography, he will be scoring more marks, I'm opting history, no. Your competition is with not that candidate. Your competition is with those candidates who are writing bins with history and you have to be best among them, clear? And for that you will have to achieve the peak performance. How to achieve that peak performance, we'll discuss about that also. Are you getting my point? This one thing. This is about time management. No. Another major agenda is what approach we'll be following. Clear? So next major agenda of this session is approach. And this approach, our focus will be on minimum input and maximum output. How to ensure this? Minimum output and maximum output from these classes and with respect to this subject. First of all, we'll understand how to ensure this. If you want to become master of anything, you have, first of all, you have to decide your target. Until the target is fixed, how will you hit the target? You cannot go on hitting everything like this. You will never be able to achieve the target. This means that if you want a nail to go inside the wall, you have to hit on the nail. If you keep on hitting on the wall, nail will not go inside, it will remain at that place. And all efforts are totally futile, clear? So first of all, to gain that maximum output with minimum output, one thing that we'll be doing is, we will first of all understand the syllabus prescribed by UPSC. That's the only thing that has been given to us directly by UPSC. One another thing that has been given indirectly is the previous year question papers, not more than us. UPSC have not asked to, uh, UPSC has not given book list to us. UPSC has not named, named the institute to join. No, nothing like that. Even a person sitting back in village can also score marks, provided his strategy is right, clear? So another thing is, first is syllabus. So syllabus basically define our circumference within which we have to rotate for four and a half months or five months. If we don't follow that circumference or daira, obviously we won't be able to reach the targets, clear? We can become teacher of history, but we won't be able to qualify UPSC examination. That is not the purpose of giving syllabus. So first of all, with minimum output, maximum output, we'll stick to our syllabus. We'll first of all understand the syllabus, topic by topic. Within the syllabus, we'll understand the predictability part at the same time. And then we'll start our classes so that with understanding of syllabus, we will be hitting the target in every class, every second, every hour. We don't deviate. So first of all, we have to prevent ourselves from being deviated, and the only thing is to stick with the syllabus. There's one thing to understand. After understanding the syllabus, first then we'll have to go with coverage part. When we start the classes, we'll cover every topic and subtopic. We won't skip anything. See, I asked you that topics are overlapping. Those topics which are overlapping will be covered once, anyway, because there is no point of repetition. But nothing will be skipped. That is for sure, because I'm standing with this responsibility that you are here to cover the whole syllabus. Even small topic will not be skipped. I'll be covering everything, because if all the coverage is there with you, again, you don't have to run here and there. Sit back at your place, revise the things, the work is done, clear? So coverage, depending on the topics mentioned in the syllabus, and that too with in-depth analysis. Next is, again, connectivity, clear? Now, connectivity here, does not mean connectivity only with current developments as compared to other subjects like PubAd, sociology, or even geography. Connectivity here means connectivity between ancient and medieval India, connectivity between modern India and world history. What do I mean? There are certain questions asked sometimes that how far Ashokan policy of Dham can be equated with Akbar's policy of Sulhikul. Clear? That connectivity will be doing. 
clear why connectivity because anyway if such questions come which are very scoring in nature if you have understood ashok's dham properly and you have understood ashok akbar policies will equal you yourself will connect in the class i will just assist you class will be participatory it will not be only top down approach it, things will come from bottom also from your side also clear i'll just tell you the basically the points and you will easily be able to correlate the things once you have understood properly so connectivity among between the topics sometimes it is said compare and contrast the viability of ikta system with mansabdari system clear that connectivity i am talking about clear that right now we discuss question spanish also ruined napoleon like deccan also ruined aurangzeb that connectivity i am talking current developments connectivity will discuss only with respect to world history especially with nato certain amount of wto and all otherwise what developments will associate with asia while as a development will associate with siraj dola clear this is one thing this is comparison with this is connectivity with current affairs clear no another important thing to ensure maximum out of output with right approach will come to that point before that we'll take a question yeah please Hmm. Uh, you mentioned about Muslim neighborhood and, and about uh, Ashokan. Dham. Hmm. So, so, can, so uh, both are the part of the history, but can they be connected to the present times of the idea of the polity in secondary? See, it can be done. It can be connected. But uh, a word of caution here, clear? The word of caution is connectivity in history must not be very wide. or must not be remotely associated I mean to say so that sense of history may not get disturbed clear sometimes back i read an article the article was related to naxal movement that naxals are located in certain pockets of india that is the tribal belts of india chota nagpur belt and all an article said that in order to eliminate naxals and mass collectively the policy makers of india should follow the approach of sesha but what says that it was that whenever certain amount of rebellions was bound to occur at certain places he encircled that places and he set the whole place on fire no meanwhile i i that article was written but why i am saying a word of caution clear do you think that that kind of approach which was followed by medieval monarchs can be followed in our country where human rights and other organizations are so active so that will be a wild connectivity i rule out that article i personally rule out that article clear because obviously medieval system was marked by autocratic rule but present system is marked by democratic governance clear it cannot be done okay this is one thing loyalty towards the state is another thing but at the same time loyalty at that time was a different concept altogether it was personality associated no it's not personality associated no it's associated with the constitution of india so connectivity can be done provided it is apt and whether it's apt we'll discuss in the class i'll let you know that this is can be done this cannot be done of history cannot be disturbed that must be kept in mind yeah please See again, I'll let you know. See, me nee, again, I'll let you know. All these are not absurd; these are abstract, no, often. But these questions are there, or these topics are there in the syllabus. We have to cover this. Obvious. That's what I told you. We will cover every subtopic and topic. But while covering the whole syllabus, we will be hinting at points whereby you need to pause. and you need to ensure predictability but at the same time topics are to be covered like you talked about satwahans clear that architecture of satwahans clear anti buddhist see satwahans were basically patronizers of brahmanical faith clear and satwahans constructed rock cut temples and rock cut caves also in the region of dakkan clear but at the same time satwahans were not anti buddhist it is basically a claim of a historian it is defied because satwahans were tolerant enough to support buddhist art and architecture also because during their patronage only amravati and nagarjuna kunda emerged to be 
Buddhist artistic centers. At the same time, even though sadhvans were supporters of Brahminical faith, but they didn't accept Sanskrit as the official language. The official language was Prakrit, which was the language of Buddhist religion. That indicate that Satwahans were not anti-Buddhist. They were tolerant enough, but formally they supported and patronized Brahmanical faith. Similar to this only, last year only a question was asked, clear? That do you think that Shunga rulers, Shunga rulers were anti-Buddhist in nature? Comment. No, Shunga rulers were not anti-Buddhist. Yeah, Pushyamitra Shunga was a Brahman, clear? And he wanted to revive Brahmanism. He revived also. He began to perform Vedic sacrifices. But during the rule of Shungas only, the Stupas of Sanchi and Bharud were repaired and maintained properly. This indicates that they were not anti-Buddhist. This is mentioned in two literary works. That literary works are Deepavamsh and Mahavamsh in Sri Lanka that say that they persecuted Buddhists. But literary sources are to be taken with pinch of salt because literary sources are biased in nature also. Clear? So since they are biased, we rely more on archaeological, epigraphical sources. We'll come to comparative analysis of sources also. That indicate that Shungas were not anti-Buddhist, rather they were tolerant in nature. Hydraulic concept, because anyway I'll let you know, medieval system was very much important because of innovation in agriculture technology. And most of this technology came from Central Asia and Iran, because they have very constant touch with Iranians and Central Asia. Hydraulic concept was followed at that time that resulted into basically taking away water from different areas. In fact, there was a concept of Persian wheel in order to procure water for domestic purposes. It was in GS also, clear? Persian, about, question about Persian wheel. It was also known as Shakya. Shakya or Persian wheel was a technology to raise water. All these resulted into growth and development of agriculture because medieval monarchs totally relied on agriculture, growth and development. So, since we'll cover the whole syllabus, obviously these questions will automatically come and ultimately we'll come to your point also, clear? When we'll talk about achieving the peak performance, we'll go to all the previous questions also. In the class itself, we'll discuss. Clear? We will not skip anything. This is one thing clear. Another thing is, next important thing, approach. With minimum output and maximum output with respect to history optional, as we have discussed earlier also, with respect to this thing, one thing needs to be emphasized is map entries. Clear? 50 marks compulsory question has to be attempted by every candidate. Out of 50 we have discussed, we have discussed even scoring 40 plus is not a big task. Out of 20, you have to just highlight 20 sites or identify 20 sites, write 20 to 30 words. We'll be doing it side by side along with ancient India. Buddhist sites also, Paleolithic sites also, Indus Valley sites also. And at the same time, have my book on map entries for history optional. All the sites are there. We'll be discussing side by side in the class. Nothing will come outside because more than 500 sites are there. And every year you just correlate. Most of the sites are from that book only. So when we'll have, just have that book with you, we'll correlate all Indus Valley sites, Harappa, Monjodaro, Lothal, Kalibangan. We'll look at because how to memorize also, how to remember also, all these sites, first of all, identify the region because Indus Valley was in Indus Valley area, northwestern part of India. So most of the sites will be in northwestern part of India. We'll discuss the states also. So obviously, when we talk about Lothal, obviously I'll let you know it's, uh, it was a seaport located on the region of Gujarat. Clear. So it will be done easily. Side by side. Along with that, map entries will be done, which is very important to score marks in paper one. And another important thing is, Time P, completion of course. It's a very important thing. Discipline, clear? Four and a half months to maximum five months. We'll not go beyond that. Why time management I'm emphasizing here? When we start by the end of June, clear? July, August, September, October. By October end, anyway, we'll wind up. That is one thing. That is why we'll have classes five days in a week, clear? We'll wind up. Why the reason being? From October onwards, it, all of you must be thinking of appearing the next year pressure of preliminary exams starts. From November, you are free from optional. From November till May, you can devote exclusively for prelims examination. So it will be a timely completion, right time to start, so that by October end you are done with optional, and from November onwards, you can exclusively focus on preliminary examination. This is one thing, this is the logic of starting the course right now, okay? Next to this was approach. Now coming to the fourth agenda, fourth is, how to become ready for exam. 
Now this was all about classes, materials, approach, everything. Now finally you have to go to the battlefield also, clear? Only having net practice will not solve the problem, clear? Now coming to how to get ready for exam. This is our fourth major thing. So how to get ready for exam. Fourth major agenda, clear? Ready for exam. Why I'm here only? I'm talking this thing after all the syllabus is prepared. Topics and subtopics has been done. Conceptual clarity is done. Syllabus is prepared. Now we get to ready for preparation, examination. Conceptual clarity has been done in the class. At the same time, right approach has been followed to ensure maximum output with minimum effort at this time. Now, to get ready to prepare examination, you need to tailor made yourself with respect to questions being asked in UPSC and the answer format that you will be presenting to the examiner. For this, obviously, we'll refer to previous year questions, PYQs, clear? We'll refer to last year's solved papers. We'll discuss questions related to major topics asked in the previous year. We'll take some tough questions asked so that you are ready to handle those questions also. Easy questions in any way can be handled because you have done with the course. But some questions which are twisted also, we'll discuss those questions, previous other questions. My books are there, two, two volumes are there on paper one and paper two, we'll have those books also. We'll discuss all the previous other questions, major ones, clear? Just to configure you to get ready for examination conditions. You will have be placed under examination situation. Attending classes or lecture in the class is a different ball game. And writing examination in three hours in UPSC Hall is a different ball game. Clear? There, it's not only knowledge. There it will be structured knowledge, revised knowledge, because you don't have to think much. Out of three hours, you have to utilize every single minute there. Clear? So previous are questions, so that you get into touch with the mode of question and answer. And finally, not only previous are question, next after discussing previous are question comes mm, writing practice. Clear? What you will do there? You don't have to say anything verbally. There in UPSC, you have to write answers. So writing practice, clear? I'll try my best that almost after completion of every single topic, I'll give you one or two questions in the class itself, make you write for 15 minutes, and I'll evaluate myself. At the same time, back at your place also, you can go for writing practice. Test series will also go on side by side. If you want to join, you can go with that also. All the papers, whether it's clusters or test series, with respect to history optional, I will be evaluating personally. Very candid. It will not be get delegated to anyone else. Since I'm starting with history optional, I'll make it clear that every single sheet comes to me. And I will personally come to you to discuss all the problems related to answer. The reason being why I'm telling you. Content has been given to you. All, the, all of you must be having the same notes after the completion of the course. But all of you will write different answers to the same question. That's a reality. Because writing practice one thing, which varies from every candidate to another candidate. Someone will write very good introduction and conclusion, but body will not be very good. Someone will write good context and context, but content will not be right. Someone will write good English, but at the same time, presentation may not be right. So every candidate has their own set of problems, and it can be addressed only when their single copy comes to mind individually. So that with individually can set, give them feedback to work upon, and with every practice, you will improve. It doesn't come overnight. It takes time, clear? So with every answer practice, you will improve gradually. So that will only place you in the examination condition. So how to become exam ready? First is completion of the subject, subject on the timely basis. Second is at the same time PYQs. Once PYQs has been done, you are in the mold of question answer, start framing your own answers. That is writing sessions exhaustively. And with that writing session, we'll get to know how to present your knowledge in effective format. Even you will know more, but you have to write only 200 words, not more than that summarize that knowledge into 200 words. That is making something crisp is a challenging task. Expanding something is a very easy thing, but condensing something is a tough task. That requires sufficient amount of practice. This will be three things to be followed to place you under examination condition. This was about fourth. Yeah, please. See, again, I'll let you know. Approach, difference in approach is only one thing. In optional, we'll be emphasizing more on historiography. Historiography means, again, I'll let you know what. You will understand better. Like Hashwarthan only, I told you. 
that Harshwardhan was not himself great, but he was great because of two important persons, Ban Bhatt and Yuan Sang. We'll write elaborately about Ban Bhatt and Yuan Sang in our optional. But in general studies, we won't be emphasizing more on historiography. We'll be writing directly on Harshwardhan. Clear? Because obviously, it's a general answer to be written, not the answer in depth, because you are competing with all the candidates. Clear? So their historiography is not to be written. Direct answers are to be written. Clear? For instance, if you like, discuss the architecture of Brihadeshwar Temple in South India. That's the GS question. Clear? Now, when you write architecture, you write it is a Dravid style of architecture, Viman is there, Gopuram is there. Are you getting my point? Clear? You will write directly the architecture. But in optional, you would have to write the context, setting. That first of all, why Raj Raj first decided to construct this temple? He wanted to commemorate his political victory. As a symbol of commemorating political victory, he went on constructing temples. Context. Why he chose Tanjore? It was the capital city. Clear? Why such a huge temple? Just to show his glory and power at this time. So in optional, you go for contextual setting rather than coming to directly on point. In GS, we directly come to the point. Content remains same. Approach is only contextual reference has to be given in option because that indicates your mastery. But in general studies, they don't need your mastery. They need your direct answer. That's clear. That's one. Way. Optional. 200 words. One short notes, if it is short notes, you have to write 150 words. And long questions, not more than 200 words these days. 200 to 250 words maximum, not more than that. So you have to need to summarize as well. That is why writing practice. When we write sentences, I know, because I also used to practice like you earlier, we write long sentences. We use two and, 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 and write 25 to 30 words in single sentence. No, that's not the right approach. Write short sentences. Write even two words constitute a sentence. If you write short sentences, it, it gives punching effect on the examiner. It indicates clarity of thought. Don't get connecting the three, two things in one or two things or three things in single sentence. Write short sentence, end the subject. Write short paragraphs. It will increase the visibility of your answer. If you write long paragraphs, it becomes monotonous. All these things have to be taken into point when you are under examination condition. That is why writing sessions are important. Clear. In modern India, I'll ask you simply simple questions. Clear. There was regulating act, Pitts India Act, then Government of India Act, then Indian Council Act. Why the changes in nomenclature? All the acts could have been written as Government of India Act. There is some concepts involved. In general study, those concepts may not be important. In option, you have to know. Why regulating act? Because purpose of British Parliament in London was to regulate or control a private company that is British India Company. It was termed as regulating act. Indian Councils Act, because all these acts were enacted within India by Central Legislative Council. It's known as Indian Councils Act. Those acts which were enacted in British Parliament in London, Government of India Act. They were comprehensive in nature. You have to understand these differences. And without that mastery, you won't be able to differentiate yourself with other candidates. As I told you, you have to be best among all the history optional candidates conceptual things. Many candidates doesn't know, many people doesn't know why Government of India Act, why Indian Councils Act, why Regulating Act, why Pits India Act. Basic things are very important to be understood. There's a logic behind that. Everything has a logic. And if you're writing anything without logic, it doesn't make any sense. And for that, you don't have to memorize anything. You have to understand things. It's clear. Approach. Next is to how to become ready for examination. Three things are to be kept in mind. First of all, conceptual clarity. Second is PYQs, previous equations, and then comprehensive writing practice. That will place you in examination condition. Now this is done. Now coming to the last stage. Once you are prepared for exam also, it's not enough. Now you have to excel in the examination. And to excel in the examination, you have to achieve peak performance. Now how to achieve? the peak performance. Because until this you achieve this peak performance, how will you score high? How will you score 300 plus to get into good rank, good place, clear? How to achieve performance? First is 
command over the subject. That is much more important. That has been done already. But that command will not only come with completion of class. That command will come with continuous revision. You have to revise things. You have to recollect things properly. And for that, revisions must. And at least you have to go for five revisions before writing your men's examination. It should come, your mind. And that to in right order. Clear? So that you are able to write within specified time and limit. And word limit also. Constantly. So command doesn't mean completion of the course. Here command means constant revision with consolidated knowledge. That's one thing. Another thing is not only after commanding, you have to make yourself structured, knowledge structured. Clear? Political policy of, of, of Ashok, economic policy of Ashok, religious policy of Ashok. Until you are structured properly, properly mentally, it won't get reflected in your answer also. And how it comes? With revision. When you revise things continuously, it gets set in your mind, then you go for structuring things. Akbar, systematic expansion. Starting from Agra, first of all towards the Rajput states, then towards the northern India, then eastern India, and then southern part of India. It is death in 1605. Mansab Dari and Jagir Dari system. Mansab, three points must be there in your mind. Jagir, three, four points must be there in your mind. Then coming to religious ideas, Ibadat Khana, three points must be there. Sulhekul, three points must be done. Deen Elahi, you have two points. It's structured way. And that will again come with revision. Because once it is structured, you are confident in the examination room. That I have a structured thing, I don't have to think much. You have read the question, understand the question, write the answers in structured way. Examiner is not looking for academicians. Examiner is looking for the perfect personality as administrator. And the greatest quality of administrator is his structured, his clarity. Clear? And for that, revision is required. And next is time management. Once you have structured, time management will automatically come. If you add 250 words, you will like 15 to 20 minutes sufficiently, not more than that. And that will again come with revision and structuring. Because if you start thinking in the exam process, you won't be able to complete in time. So that means time management has to be strictly followed. And that will come with practice. First answer may not be on time. But while you write 10th answer, you will be almost nearly perfectly on time. Clear. And ultimately, apart from all, all these things have to be done with constant guidance of or mentorship of a person. So while you write these answers, while you get prepared, I'm always there to help you out. Wherever you face any problem with respect to concept, writing, Obviously, a person should be there to help you out. Just because without that, achieving peak performance is almost a difficult task. These things are to be done. Once you follow all these things, I'll let you know the technicalities of answer also. What major things are looked into answer? Contextual clarity, then conceptual clarity, and at last, content clarity. Not in the bill. I'll explain you how to write answer. So context, you have to set the context first of all. Why Ashok adopted Dham? Why Ashok adopted Dham? He could, have, he, could have, he could have gone for physical conquest only. He went for Kaling War in the year 261 BC. Why? Because none, no territory was left to be conquered. So he adopted a clever strategy. Rather than fighting wars, unite the diverse people through a common method of social custom. He gave Dham. You have to understand context. Yaad nahi karna hai, samajna hai. Context. Once context is done, then go for concept. What is the concept of dham? Dham is basically a Prakrit version of dharm. And dharm does not mean religion. This is the problem. Dham means social order. Dharm does not mean religion. Dharm means social order. And dham is the Prakrit version of the word dharm. To maintain social order with harmony and tolerance. That is dharm shastra. Dharm shastra is not about religion to maintain social order. And social order in Hinduism means perfect hierarchy among the Brahmans, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, and finally, the Shudras. Clear? So that thing needs to be understood. Clear? So first of all, contextual clarity, conceptual clarity, and content. Even if you write two less content, marks will not be deducted. But if you write a wrong con concept, totally wrong. So last come, content. 
when you write answer, I'll let you know briefly what exactly has to be done in the answers. While you read answers, try to understand the question first of all. After understanding the question, first of all, I'll make it very clear what proportion and weighted has to be given in the answer. There may be two parts in the question. There may be three parts also. There can be a single question, clear? There can be Akbar established Mughal Empire after enlisting the support of Rajputs. Orleans have destroyed it by alienating the Rajputs. Clear? Now you have to first of all give proportional weightage. Proportional weightage will be given more on Akbar's policy of enlisting and less on Aurangzeb's policy of alienating. Why? Because that was not the sole reason for decline of Mughal Empire. There were crisis in Jagirdari system, financial crisis and the crisis. So historical sense will get reflected through proportional weightage also in the answer. Clear? So proportional weightage will also come. Clear? After proportional weightage, prioritization of points. Which points are to be written first, then followed by other points. For instance, I'll let you know. Discuss the factors that led to the decline of Mauryan Empire. And first only you write, Ashokan policy of Dham was responsible for Mauryan Empire. No. Because scholars believe that reasons are to be looked into socio-economic setting rather than one single factor. It was financial crisis. It was unguarding the northwest frontier region. Go into that depth. Then prioritize the point. Because prioritization itself is reflects your sense of understanding. Mastery of the subject. So when you will write answers, I'll, you know, I'll let you know how to go about all these things. And then finally, obviously, prioritization, proportional weightage, understanding. To some extent, neatness of your answer, neatness of the answer sheet, don't go for much overwriting. And all these overwriting are done by those candidates who have not structured and revised things. Those who have structured and revised things, they won't commit such mistakes. And if you go for overwriting, overwriting is not a problem in itself. But overwriting gives a sense to the examiner that you are not sure about things. And if you are not sure about things, it gives a negative impression. And subjectivity is always there in men's examination and evaluation. Avoid that. And it will come only when a structured and revised content is there in your mind. Are you getting my point? That will give you mastery. Overwriting itself is not a problem. But overwriting, what does it give? That you are not sure about things. And since you are not sure about things, your decision-making power will be less. And what is the most important criteria of an administrator? Decision making. Ethics and integrity paper, case studies is there. What is the logic? Only to judge the decision making power of candidate. What ultimately you will be doing there as an administrator? You will be taking decisions. How prompt and right you are in decision making. Overwriting is not a problem in itself, but it shows lack of confidence and decision making. Are you kidding my point? Clear? So these things are to be taken into point, clear, with respect to history optional, clear. We'll be starting with this optional subject. I think date would be given by you in the, by the industry. I think the last week of June only will be starting. We'll bind up by the end of October. It's clear. We'll start with ancient India only from the very beginning. And I'll start with paper one, clear? Is that clear? Any question? No, not the thing is open to all of you. Questions coming to your mind. Anything that you want to ask related to history option, related to what we have discussed from the beginning. Anything that comes to your mind, be, just feel free to ask. No. See, again, I'll let you know. In order to give sense of completion, I told you that repetition is there. Just to main, make it your mind that don't get bogged out of just by the length of the slavers. But obviously, to give a sense of completion to all of you, we will start the topic as mentioned in UPSC. Yeah. First of all, we cover sources. Hmm. We'll discuss all the sources, literary sources, sources in scientific source literature, religious literature, literature in regional languages, Pali and Prakrit also, Tamil also, that is Sangam literature and all. We'll discuss all those things, sources. Then we'll move on to pre history and proto history. Mean to say, I won't skip any subtopic or topic. And you need also need to check me continuously. So always come to the class with syllabus. Slavers is the only thing to judge anyone. Because UPSC has given only one thing to us. They have not asked you to join me, or they have not asked you to join any other person. You can prepare yourself also. 
बिकॉज यू पी एस सी इज गिवन वन थिंग टू यू सिलेबस दायरा तय कर दिया उन्होंने उन्होंने दायरा तय कर दिया अब इफ यू आर डिविएटिंग योर सेल्फ दैट इज योर प्रॉब्लम नॉट प्रॉब्लम ऑफ यू पी एस सी आर वेटिंग माई पॉइंट सो ऑब्वियसली कीप सिलेबस विथ यू एवरी टाइम एंड इट्स नॉट ओनली विथ हिस्ट्री ऑप्शन टेलिंग यू हैव सिलेबस ऑफ जी एस ऑल्सो एवरी टाइम बिकॉज द वर्ड्स मैंशन द सिलेबस दे नेवर आस्क क्वेश्चन बियॉन्ड सिलेबस मेक इट श्योर यू पी एस सी इज वेरी क्लियर इफ यू आर नॉट प्रिपेयर इट्स योर फॉल्ट बट इफ यू आर प्रिपेयर विथ ईच एंड एवरी टॉपिक क्वेश्चन आर नेवर आस आउट ऑफ द सिलेबस दैट्स अ रियालिटी सो प्रिडिक्टेबिलिटी इज वेरी हाई बट प्रोवाइडेड आवर अप्रोच इज राइट आवर स्ट्रैटेजी इज राइट क्लियर सो वी वोट स्कीप एनी थिंग टू गिव अ सेंस ऑफ कंप्लीशन ए टू जेड विल स्टार्ट विथ सोर्सेज एंड विल एंड विद द यू एस एसिडेंसी एज द लोन सुपर पावर इन द वर्ल्ड see anyway anyway we'll be doing that we'll be repeating that when we'll do ashok we'll do ashokan inscriptions yeah. we'll have to do that ashokan inscriptions ashokan edits we have to do that anything else hmm. i don't think so why do you ask this question that biasness of the examiner just Maybe explain with us hmm. ah please tell me the examiners are biased yeah. with respect to See, again, I'll let you know. Clear. <clears throat> This examination is quite scientific in nature, and still insulated from such biasness. See, if you are planning to enter the system, you need to trust the system fully. Mark words. If you are planning to enter into bureaucracy, trust the system of bureaucracy finally. If you have any iota of doubt. it will trouble you not anyone else this examination is absolutely fair if you are writing properly you will get marks why is this you mean to say what what like for instance i let you communalism let you i i'll take the most controversial topic of history communalism in modern india clear communalism in will read about all india muslim league will read about hindu mahasabha will read about rss also will read study about all of them all of these things but when we write communalism unless unless until unless you are biased examiner will not be biased first of all you need to ensure that you are not biased are you getting and you are not biased this has to be ensured by me that is my responsibility and here i am telling you quite clear Communalism, if we look into concept, communalism is a theory that has nothing to do with religion. I may seem to be sound to be quite radical. Communalism is a concept that has nothing to do with religion, because person is identified on several criteria. Person can be identified on the basis of his height. on the basis of your appearance on the basis of region to which he belong on the basis of clothing pattern on the basis of his food habit person can be identified on several basis and person can be identified on the basis of religion also but over emphasizing only one criteria to identify any person is totally wrong clear is totally wrong if a person is a sikh his name is gagandeep singh are you getting my point he is a human being his criteria he can be identified on the basis of his profession he can be identified on the basis of his qualification he can be identified on the basis of region to which he belong he can be identified on the basis of knowledge that he has he can be identified on the basis of clothing pattern why do you identify him only on the basis of his religion communalism has to do with identification of person and identifying by over emphasizing only on one criteria when other criteria is already there it's a mistaken concept and british did that they over emphasized only on one criteria to identify person just to serve their own interest that resulted into common sense that conceptual thing so first of all we need to understand what exactly is the problem problem is having only one criteria to identify person you have heard his name He is Mr. Ansari, and you realize he is a Muslim community person. But there may be other criteria also. If you want to identify that person, ask his qualification, ask his profession, ask his 
experiments, experience, ask other things also. But why to emphasize only on one criteria? That is one thing. So first of all, if you want that, first of all, he need to be unbiased. And examiners are unbiased, totally have, have this faith. Because I'm telling you, if we are entering the system, have total faith in the system. And why I'm telling you this? I'm not telling you this to qualify the exam. I'm telling you to serve this country as a bureaucrat also. Because when you will go with this baggage of idea, you will not be a good administrator even there also. Persons who are good administrators are those persons who are totally unbiased. Who have the logic of thinking rationally. That is why they still frame. Why we call the bureaucracy still frame? Because we, select that we are selecting the candidates on the basis of merit. And those candidates coming on the basis of merit must be unbiased. Because they have been identified and selected on the basis of merit, not on any other basis. Believe in that merit, develop that merit here, and have faith in the system. That is much more important. If you are entering the system, believe that system is good. Because even if it is not good, you have to make the system good. It's your responsibility. You can not only enter the moving train, sometimes you have to lay the tracks also have the capacity of laying the tracks also. Clear. It was not only the responsibility of Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Responsibility lies on all of us. Is it clear? Any other thing? Yeah, please. What is the best way to support the in the answer? Again, it, depend, it depends on the nature of topic and question. For instance, I'll let you know that the question is with respect to decline of modern empire only. Ashokan policy was responsible for the decline. S.C. Rishaudri says that Ashokan policy of Dham, Dham led to pacification and at the same time military forces became weak because no battles were fought. Clear. But Romila Thapar says that no, Dham was a master stroke of uh, Ashok, whereby he unified diverse sections on the policy of social commonness. Clear. Now, you are mentioning Romila Thapar, you are mentioning S.C. Rishaudri, D.D. Kosambi can also be mentioned. Clear. But depending on the question. But if the question is that discuss the influence of Greek art or Greek art on Gandhar school of art or Greek influence on Gandhar school of art, clear? You can mention only one art historian. It can be A. Kumar Swami. But if you write more of historians only, then where will you write the content? It depends on nature of the question. Where there is a debate, like 18th century. 18th century India was a dark age. It's a debate. Feudalism is a debate. Some scholars say that the feudalism was never there in India. Some scholars will compare Indian feudalism with European feudalism. So where there is a debate, obviously the debating topic requires historical perspective. We have to write historians. But the historians whose ideas are considered to be relevant. Clear. For instance, when Turks came to India and defeated the Rajputs in the Battle of Tarain, when Pizviraj Chauhan was defeated by Muhammad Ghori, Jadu Nasrathar, the historian says, it was nothing because, but a will of God. Now, how far will accept that it was a will of God? He was giving, he's given some divine argument, but it was not will of God. Professor Muhammad Davi was given socio-economic factors for the defeat of Rajputs. Now, we'll have to go for scientific reasons. We'll quote Jadu Nasrathar also, but we'll keep proportional importance to the argument of Professor Muhammad Habib. So depending on nature and depending on the topic. Anything else? Any other question? Anything that comes to mind? Feel free to ask. Clear. And if in, even after this session comes to an end, any one of you online also, the persons who are people who are attached, if you want to ask anything from me or if you want to meet me personally, if you have any other doubt, because people sometimes hesitate in asking when they are in class, you can take my number from here. Just they will arrange a meeting between you and me. You can come in groups also. You can come individually also. If you have any other doubt, I'll explain. That is not an issue. Is it clear? It's fine. Shall we wind this session? OK, so thank you all of you. And thank you all the candidates who are attending this session live. And hope to meet you soon. Clear? Thank you. All the best.